Up, I'm Aaron Mento, and you're watching Slasher Pepper. It's both bloody and it's refreshing. Hey guys, Slash Pepper, and welcome to another video. Today I have another interview, this time with director Aaron Mento, who directed, who directed um, Ugly Sweater Party. How are you doing? Good, how you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Glad to have you on the show. Oh, thanks, happy to be here. Awesome. So, um, do you have any new projects coming up? I do. I'm in uh, post-production on a movie called 16 Bits that I wrote and directed. And it's about a 90s video game character coming to life and going on a killing spree. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I love the, yeah, I love the concept. That's all you can yeah. say now? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it stars uh, someone who was in Ugly Sweater Party, Kevin Caliber. Um, he was one of the Shans in it who's playing volleyball with his shirt off in Ugly Sweater Party. He's the video game character. So he's like, it, it's kind of like if you played Street Fighter or Streets of Rage or something like that, like a character from one of those games coming into real life and using kind of video game Street Fighter logic to try and navigate our world. And he teams up with this guy, and this kind of loser on his birthday, and they kind of both go on this, this beat down killing spree across the city. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it's a fun one. <laughs> and um, how has 2020 been for you? I mean, with the lockdown, oh, it's been a crazy year, but... Um... Anything it's been, new? yeah, it's been hard. Uh, it's well, it, we luckily we finished shooting 16 bits like it, like, like the, we, the final day was when it started to be kind of like everybody had to wear masks and everything, but it was right before it became super critical and we got the last shots in. So, uh, I'm thankful because we had some like uh crowd scenes in there that we got before Ooh. that I'm not, I don't know, we, I don't know, we would have been able to get them. Uh, after you know the covid happened but uh yeah it's been you know we've had a lot of time to work on the post-production for it so that's good because it's in the can and there's a lot of effects for it because um uh, we're actually making a video game in the movie so it looks like a legit 16-bit fighting game so right the creation of that takes time and uh so yeah so it's yeah it's been it's been wild everything's been shut down in terms of shooting though for sure yeah, you guys got lucky because, um, like, beginning this year, I interviewed, like, right when it started, I interviewed uh, David Howard Thornton, who plays, like, Terrifier. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They just had to stop shooting, like, Terrifier yeah. 2. It should have been released by now, I think, even. Yep, yep. It's just, I mean, and I know some productions are still kind of, like, going forward anyway. And um, it's tough, though, on an indie budget because you, exactly. it, it costs – costs a lot to have like, you know, the specialists there to make sure that everything's following protocol. Um, and it's just not safe really to do it. Well, for some, for some, I'm sure you can do it for some scenes. It's safe, but for, you know, a lot of people in a room or something like that, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Like Spider-Man three or something. I know they're kind of starting production on that, but that's like Marvel, you know, they have, they have such a budget and doesn't matter. Uh. Yeah, I know. And then you find out that even like, on the Batman movie, like their main star got it, even with all the protections and stuff. And you don't know yeah. where he got it or when he got it, but it's super, yeah, it's, it's super dangerous right now. So. Exactly. Waiting on that vaccine. Exactly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't come any sooner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. How have you been holding up? Yeah, pretty good. You know, like school, um, I'm, I'm currently in like film school, uh -huh. um, but that's kind of closed down. It's, like now we have two days where I actually go to school and actually get to work with cameras and stuff. But like in March cool. and May, I had to film from home with like an iPhone, which sure. just doesn't work for this school because eventually we have to go on an internship. And as you can imagine there, you don't work with an iPhone either. So you kind of need no. to know how these cameras work and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's gotta be tough to be in school now. It's gotta be challenging yeah. for sure. Yeah. You I'm know. glad I got an internship for next year. I already have that like fixed, so I don't really need to worry about that anymore. But I'm looking forward to that because then I kind of get some more structure in my life, you know? Because yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Just ain't my thing, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I um, I got my master's in film production from Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles, and the internship that I did was 
a dream come true for me because I interned for Wes Craven's production company, wow. uh, Midnight Entertainment. Yeah, it was wild. It was so cool. And so I uh, only met him a couple times coming in, in and out of the office. But uh, one of the things that I got to do was um, they were emptying out one of his storage facilities and they were going to like transfer it to another one. And so in his storage facility, there was like just Nightmare on Elm Street props, Freddy's sweater, the glove. And uh, the one that I always tell people about that I think is so funny is uh, there was a rack of leather gimp suits from People Under the Stairs that was just in his storage <laughs> facility. And I like love that movie. So yeah, I, he was a huge influence on me. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street was like the movie that got me into horror. So interning for that company was like so cool. Yeah, I can imagine. That must have been, indeed, like you said, a dream come true. Yeah, it was so cool. Yeah. And um, what was it like directing Ugly Sweater Party? It was a lot of fun. It was, it was a lot of fun and a lot of work. Um, we shot that in Idlewild. So it's out in the woods. Um, my effects uh, expert and location manager, Richard Calderon, he told me that he knew someone who had a campsite, like a standing campsite that was under construction. Like they're going to turn it into some sort of a summer camp. And so um, we decided we're gonna, we're gonna shoot it there because that's perfect. And uh, it was tricky though, because Richard basically had to get the electricity going there, get the heat going there. I mean, it was basically just like a site that didn't have a lot of maintenance on it, right? So, we, he, so he was like constantly fixing heat and electricity while we were shooting in this like kind of untamed wilderness uh, <laughs> for this movie. And so uh, it was a lot, it was a lot of work. We'd only be there for 10 days and we had a lot to shoot, a lot of technical stuff to shoot. So it was a challenge, but the crew was great. The cast had a blast and it was like going to summer camp. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It looked like you guys had a lot of fun. Yeah. It did. And um, what was your favorite scene to film? Um, I really had a good time shooting the scene uh, between Felissa Rose and Charles Chutabala when they're having their makeout in the cabin <laughs> and um, he's trying to get the sweater off and it will come off. And then that whole thing was just like, I mean, we were dying laughing that whole scene and uh, Felissa is so much fun and she's so funny. So, uh, and, and those two had really good chemistry together. So that was a really fun scene to shoot for sure. Um, yeah, that, that would be, that's one of my favorites for sure. Uh, it was one of my favorite scenes to watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> And um, if you could write and direct a movie for a big or classic horror character or franchise, um, what character or franchise would it be? Well, I think it would either be Nightmare on Elm Street. I would love to do a new Nightmare on Elm Street movie with Robert England back as Freddy still. Of course. Um, that's one. And then the other one would be, uh, I would love a crack at Phantasm. I would love to do a new like new stories within that universe so it wouldn't be like a remake it would be like something that's also happening like like maybe like parallel to what are, is already happening in that series uh because i love the phantasm series i think that'd be great yeah that's a very interesting idea and um what are some of your own favorite horror movies um let's see yeah uh i really love uh nightmare on elm street 2 as well uh that was oh, one yeah, that that's really creeped yeah, right. I, it's kind of got like a, a love it or hate it kind of vibe for a lot of people, but I really liked that movie growing up. Um, it was, I, I found it really scary that Freddie was like kind of ripping this guy open over and over again and like kind of killing everybody that he loved. And, uh, and then the scene where Freddie attacks the pool party, like, really left a mark on me. And uh, I think that plays even scarier now after all the shootings, school shootings and oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, when like, you know, I think for some people, maybe it didn't seem that scary or that like they couldn't really relate to it. Maybe like, you know, oh, it's it's not as scary because Freddie's around all these people and stuff like that. But I think that that scene takes on a new power, you know, post all the shootings and stuff. Having someone show up in a crowd and just start killing everybody is, uh, pretty scary for me growing up seeing that scene. Um, so that was one that I really loved. Um, I really love the Phantasm series we already mentioned. The, the creativity of those is so great. Um, 
you know, the Texas Chainsaw movies, all, all the, uh, those are like just so good. I love them. Uh, part two, especially just how whacked out that was. It's like one of those things where it's like, um, you can't believe they got the money to do like Texas Chainsaw <laughs> 2. Like on that budget, on that scale, with that kind of just insane energy to it. And um, yeah, I love stuff like that. Um, I would say that the um, the original Exorcist was a big, big influence on me. Um, not necessarily style-wise, but just with how powerful and frightening a movie could be and um, how... It could be like more about the characters than than the horror because I think the characters in that are really super strong oh, and yeah. the writing is so good, you know. And it's like, um, yeah, I like all this, but I also love like like Canadian horror. I'm a huge fan of Canadian horror, so My Bloody Valentine is like one of my favorite slashers. And so I go on and on. I like just love <laughs> love horror movies. Yeah, if, if it has a good story and. Um... Or, or it doesn't have a good story and it's just a lot of yeah. fun. Really, anything horror, usually yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. can't go wrong, really. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah, are you familiar with uh, the Tim Ritter movies? Like, uh, Tim Ritter, uh, which ones are those? Uh, the Truth no, or Dare franchise Kingsbury. from like the 80s and stuff. I don't think I've seen any of those, no. Okay, it's like really obscure, but... Um, Ugly Sweater Party kind of reminded me of that kind of kind of film. Oh, so cool! Check it out. I think they're all on like YouTube now, anyways. Um, okay, Tim Ritter. Okay, I'll totally check yeah, those out. Definitely, I'll I'll email it to you after the interview. Okay, great, thanks. Very and cool. uh, about a nine one three two, I I didn't think of it that way yet, um, like as a school shooting. But I know there's one book, uh, like a nine one three dream spawn, where at the end it's basically just. 50 to 100 pages of uh, Freddy killing people in a school and then setting up oh, wow. our final girl as a school shooter. And wow. it's like really, it's, it's really gross and gory and really cool. Oh, man. Oh, I want to read that. That's, that's, that's cool, oh, yeah. man. It's awesome. And, and then someone else um, I talked to said, and I'm an Street 2, a lot of people say it kind of breaks the rules which is, you know, true. But she pointed out it's the second movie, so they didn't really have the rules yet. It's more that sure. part three, four, and the others kind of ignored the rules from part two. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it. It's like, you know, the first one was already kind of, uh, you know, obviously dreamy with its logic and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and so um, I kind of like that the sequel kind of like did its own thing. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, of course, uh, you don't want to that, repeat yourself. Yeah, so I always I always enjoyed that one, um, and I was actually surprised years later finding that it had a bad reputation for a while, and now it's kind of getting a reevaluation. I think people are liking it a lot more, so that's cool because I, I sure. like that movie a lot. Yeah. And um, what is your favorite weapon for a slasher? Oh man, uh, if you can call it a slasher, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, obviously this the chainsaw is awesome um i love that i also love in the burning the the shears oh yeah um that's oh, i love that that whole rap sequence where he just chops up like five people with those things so just amazing like gnarly yeah so i'd say those i like those a lot those are a little bit like i don't know there's something about like garden tools that yeah. are just like you know just breaking down a body with those it's just like so brutal but uh yeah those are fun for me it's it's an axe i always like that because it's i don't know yeah. it's like so heavy or something and again it's <laughs> yeah. like a garden too so there's something scary about it because you could see it in real life laying somewhere you know yeah do you have your favorite axe kill or favorite axe scene in the slasher movie um i would say i think i think uh in the strangers Two, pray at night um, oh yeah yeah i i feel you know the way in like at the swimming pool yeah. It's such a heavy scene because it's already in water. So it's like you're already moving slower. And then there's this guy with an ax like in the water too. And it's yeah, that was cool. so tiresome to watch that, but I love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was a cool scene for sure. Um, I always liked that uh, the movie Madman. Have you seen that one? Uh, I have Madman Mars. Poster. 
Yeah, I think you dig that one. That one's a really cool uh, 80s slasher. He has an axe in that, and there's a few um, axe killings that are pretty brutal in that one, too. Of you course, you, you, you got to mention the kill in Friar the 13th, the original, like the axe coming. Oh, yeah, right? so it's good. Classic. So classic, yeah. Did you, uh, did you get that new box set that, that came out? I did not. No, I'm all the way yeah. in Ireland, and I don't have a region-free Blu-ray player. And I'm not sure. Yeah, about that's right. We were talking about that. But yep. shipping would probably yep. be a lot of money, too. You're probably right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm still waiting on it, but I do eventually want to get it because those movies are so awesome. What's your favorite Friday the 13th movie? Uh, Jason Lives, for sure. Nice. But yeah, quite honestly, I love um, uh, Takes Manhattan. And Me Ghost too. Now, Jason and Axe, I also love. Because they're so yeah. much fun. And that's why Friday the 13th is my favorite franchise. Because you kind of have like the more, you know, serious movies in the beginning. But if you want a fun movie, then there are tons of fun movies too to check out, you know. There's Absolutely. so much variety to that franchise, really. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I also, I love Takes Manhattan. That's probably my favorite one. Which yeah. is another one that kind of has like kind of a sketchy kind of love it or hate it kind of uh, vibe yeah, for to sure. it. But, uh, I always liked that one. It was just, that one's the most fun for me. It was just like, um, I didn't mind that they were on the boat for, for a while. I know a lot of people didn't like that, but him killing on a boat was pretty cool, I thought. And yeah. then um, when they finally get to Manhattan, which I'm, not, I'm sure most of it was shot in Canada, but uh, <laughs> when they finally get to Manhattan, it's still, I, I don't know, I always, I grew up on, I used to watch that one a lot on TV and I feel like that one left the biggest mark. You know what's so scary about that one to me? Um, was the fact that Jason was singularly going after the kids on the boat. So even when he got to New York, he would walk past other people and he still, for right. some reason, wanted to kill these people on, from the boat. So it was like, you could never escape him. It's like, even if you run into a crowd, he's going to go through the crowd to still find just you, you know? That like super creeped me out. The fact that you couldn't shake him, you know? Yeah, that's that's a good way to look at it. It's like... You know, once once he wants to kill you, you're the only one he's yeah. gonna go after until exactly until you're yeah. dead. Then then there's a next guest. <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to totally. look at it for sure. Uh, but yeah, the first time I watched it, I didn't like it either because I I was expecting Manhattan. Sure, um, yeah. But of course, afterwards, some people would go in close minded thinking, "Oh, I, I'm gonna hate it again." But I I went in with like a more open mind thinking, uh -huh. okay, now I know it's going to be on the boat. Let's try and give it another chance. And yeah. now I love it too. And that was one of my favorites for sure. Yeah. And that, and that opening song is so oh, good. Yeah, that, darkest the, side of the darkest night. Darkest side of the night. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I love how it bookends with that song. I'm just like, as soon as I hit play on that and that song starts, I'm like, oh yeah, I made the right choice throwing this one in. It's always like a good time. <laughs> for sure. It you just know, gets when that song in the mood. Oh, totally. Yeah. I, I love that song. Um, and now I have two more, you know, general questions. Um, okay. Deep questions, basically. Uh, what do you think hell looks like? I think hell would be repetition. And I know that's, uh, I think that might even be a line from Stephen King's Storm of the Century. But, but um, I feel like hell would be having to relive some sort of pain over and over again um kind of like with the nightmare on elm street 2 thing where like jesse is ripped apart and then he becomes whole again over and over again like he doesn't die like it's just like it's just the constant constant pain which breaks you down and then you have to start fresh again and you feel so you feel the ultimate pain and then you feel the relief of that pain being gone and then the relief is taken away over and over again that to me is what hell would be just a constant reset of, of pain over and over. I don't know what it would look like, but I think it would be, I, I kind of always think that maybe like if you go to hell and you did something really bad, um, you would be reliving that bad moment only it would be flipped and maybe you would feel the pain that you inflicted on someone else. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I also um, feel like hell is more about what, what you feel instead of what it looks like. Um, yeah, I know when I, when you think about hell, usually you kind of think about fire and, and like a throne with Satan on it. But yeah. um, 
I definitely feel like if there even is a hell, um, that it would be something like that too. Just more about your own fear or indeed like a pain or something. Yeah, yeah, I agree for sure. And um, if you could rid the world of one thing, uh, what would it be? Hmm. I would rid the world of uh, man's feeling of superiority to everything and to other creatures. Um, I think that, you know, humans are the smartest creatures on earth, but they're also the most destructive. And I think it has to do with our ego and our superiority. And I think that if we stop trying to see ourselves as dominators and start seeing ourselves as, you know, facilitators of, of peace and of, you know, using our knowledge and our skills to kind of balance things instead of trying to dominate things. Uh, obviously, I think the world would be a better place. <laughs> yeah, me too. I actually kind of, I've been thinking about that myself too. Like, you know, I, I always try to keep, you know, the ego down, which is like something all humans have like an ego, yeah. I think it's just like a bio biological thing. Um, yeah. but it's now I'm kind of trying to see humanity as one thing, you know, and sure. Um, why would you hurt yourself? Basically, like you should see humanity as one entity basically. And yeah. And, th and, th and thinking that way, why would you hurt someone else? Because then you're hurting yourself, you know? Which totally, totally. It kind of makes sense, but also doesn't. But I'm trying to kind of, I'm, I'm thinking about that a lot recently, you know? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, in the film industry, there's, there's been a reckoning of ego as well, oh, where, yeah. you know, it, it still kind of is, but it's kind of maybe being chipped away where the director doesn't have to be this like tyrant who is like the number one in charge and everybody like cowers under them and, you know, everybody's in fear of their like jobs and stuff like that. Like it doesn't have to be that way. Like you don't have to work that way. You can collaborate and you can listen and you can, you know, work together to make something. So it doesn't have to be all, you know, one person's vision, one person's exactly. like, kind of signature on it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, which I think it's, you know, obviously a lot of great movies have been made with, uh, filmmakers who are like that but I think moving forward we can be more conscious and we don't have to work like that you know what I mean like it doesn't have Definitely to be not it doesn't have to be that kind of an atmosphere you know no it just creates kind of like a a, a toxic environment you know yeah absolutely yeah that's but there, that's there definitely are some movies where you know behind the scenes it was sh shit basically yeah but there are great movies like um the shining I think Yep. Um, yep. Yep. The Abyss. I know oh, yeah. you heard about that, but that was heard some crazy yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard a lot, a lot of crazy stuff where it's just like, um, it kind of reminds me of, I read this, this, uh, this fitness book by Sylvester Stallone and, uh, in it, he broke down the workouts he did for each Rambo movie. And, um, but he lets you know, this is not the way to work out. I was doing it all wrong but he would tell you what he did. And it was like breaking rocks with like a hammer, like at four in the morning. And like, it was like so destructive to his body. And that was why I think later he had a lot of issues with, uh, with like injuries and stuff like that because he was so abusive to his body. So his fitness book was kind of trying to show, I did it this way and I got my body in shape this way, but I could have done it an easier way and gotten in the same shape and I wouldn't have been as destructive to myself. And I always kind of think about that when I think about like making anything, making a movie or something like that. Like, yeah, you could do it the very kind of um, blunt, destructive way. That's very showy. That's you can brag about. Oh, I was breaking rocks all day and stuff like that. But you're going to cause damage to yourself or someone else. Right. Or you can do it the way that's not as flashy. That's not as, you know, maybe you're not going to brag about how, what you did for your workout, but you get the same results, but it's like, a peaceful way to do it you know it's a way that's like harmonious so i always think about that when i when that i think about art yeah very strong comparison yeah yeah and um it's a cool book yeah what's the book called 
Uh, Sly Moves. It was called Sly Moves. And um, the workout stuff that he did in there was really cool too, because he tells you all these like at home workouts and stuff. Um, but it was just so eye opening reading about the punishment that he gave his body uh, right. for each one of those movies. And it's like, he's like, yeah, I know the results look good, but like, it was like, I, I was not, I like, I was incorrect to approach it this way. And I have some damage from that, you know? So like, he's like, don't do this. Like, even though it sounds <laughs> like whatever, like don't do, don't try and replicate this workout that I'm telling you about because it was incorrect, you know? So it was really interesting to read about. Awesome. Are you much of a workout yeah. person yourself that you read that or was it more? Of yeah. That? Yeah. I'm into, I'm definitely into fitness and um, it's been tough because I've been to the gym and like, you know, uh, since COVID, like all the right. gyms in LA closed <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting back into it more once the gyms open safely and everything. Um, but yeah, I love like, you know, uh, Arnold and Sylvester Stallone, like Van Damme. I love all those like martial arts movies too. And um, yeah, I love, I love fitness. So it's, uh, I don't know about you, but like, like the two things I love to watch are like horror and then just like over the top, like eighties action movies. So like <laughs> together it's like, and I kind of, you know, with ugly sweater party with the uh, laser massacre was yeah. a little bit of my, um, reference to commando when arnold gets the gun in commando and right. it's just like wiping everybody out so <laughs> there's definitely some dna in there from 80s action as well yeah yeah or yeah. i remember a scene where where this one guy is uh like heavy lifting and you get a close up yeah of his yeah. I, <laughs> yeah i, I could, yeah. thought of that now too <laughs> yep yep that's totally yeah the the, the heavy the, the heavy lifting for sure and uh what's some advice you could give to young and upcoming filmmakers um, my advice would be to write your own stuff um, if you're going to be a director um, so you can kind of control uh, what you want to say and um, your style and make sure it kind of marries appropriately to the project that you're taking. So um, I always like to look at directors who are writer directors. Um, or writers who became directors. Um, I think that way you can, for especially for your early work, you can make sure you don't bite off more than you can chew. You can, you know, um, you control like basically um, the pathway that you take to express yourself um, better if you write if you write your own stuff. Um, also, you know, you might find a really good script that you can do, but um, I think when you're starting out, especially, it's it's very helpful to figure out how to tell a story on the page and then figure out how to um, tell that same story on the set and then figure out how to tell that story in the editing room. And I think it's like super beneficial to be involved in each one of those processes and it kind of helps you for the next project. You'll remember, um, you know, some of the troubles you had in each level of that and it might make, it might make you easier to take to pave the road a little more for the next time. So I would recommend writing your own thing and also write something small, write something that is, uh, you know, that you have access to like limited location. Um, you can write something that just for your apartment, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, I think I had the, um, early on, I, I was incorrect in thinking that every single project you do has to be like, like a masterpiece or something like that. I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves like that. It's like, oh, it can't, you can't do, it's like, but then if you look back at a lot of filmmakers, you know, not every one of their first movies was like, was like a home run. They were just learning their craft and trying to express themselves. And, uh, you know, like, um, uh, you know, the uh, James Cameron did like Piranha 2, you know, was like a movie he did, right? And it's like, not many people have even seen that movie, but like, you know, he did it, probably because it was like a gig and he could finally be in the director's chair and he can like learn the craft and express himself. And maybe it wasn't aliens, but uh, it got him to aliens. Do you know what I mean? So oh, yeah. I think don't be, yeah, don't be worried about like making something that's not like as, as glossy as this, as big budget as this, you know, just make stuff. I think the important thing is just to make something and don't think or talk yourself out of doing it for any reason. Yeah, or like uh, John Carpenter's Dark Star is also a good example of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You yeah. know, it's not like, it's, 
Yeah. It's not like James Cameron he was born and then it was Terminator, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, and that happens with a lot of actors too, right? It's like some actors are like, they look like they're overnight successes because they get a big movie, but then you look at their career and it's like, oh, they already have like 20 credits. And it's like, they're, you know, it's okay to like work and to Slow figure grind. things out. Slow grind. You got it. Like I was just watching the other day, uh, I was watching Basic Instinct and like, you know, the movie that really launched Sharon Stone. And it's like, she did like, like 30 things before that. You know what I mean? And it's like, right. but that might have been the first time most people saw her. But like, you know, she was probably navigating, building, working her way up to that. And I think if, if you start out trying to be like, oh, my first movie needs to be that Basic Instinct movie. It's like, you kind of shoot yourself in the foot because it's, it, you know, you might not, that might not be possible right now. But you'll get there if you just start grinding and start working stuff out, you know? That's how I feel about it anyway, yeah. That is definitely a good way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, my last question, will there be an ugly sweater party too? You know, I'd really like to do one, and the cast is super into it. Um, it's just basically a, you know, availability, and then um, I want the story to be, you know even crazier than the first one. So I'm still, I have some ideas for it, but um, I, I don't want to just do it to do it. I want to make sure that it's, it's like one of those sequels where it takes everything up like a whole bunch of notches, you know, and just like, even if you haven't seen the first one, kind of like Evil Dead 2, it's like, even if you haven't seen the first one, it stands on its own as its own thing. And like, maybe it'll make you want to go check out the first one uh, because the sequel is so strong. But uh, I, I am interested in doing it. And the cast are like dying to do it so awesome who yeah. knows maybe one day hopefully one day yeah 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 i mean um i think i think i think it could happen so i'm excited for that sounds promising absolutely is there anything you would like to add to the interview um let's see <laughs> no i mean um if you want to uh pick up ugly sweater party on blu-ray it's uh it's uh, self-distributed, so we made the Blu-ray ourselves. We did a, a, about an hour-long making of and a commentary with uh, myself and some of the cast. So you can go to uh, Ocular Migraine. It's my production company. If you look them up on Shopify, you can find the Blu-ray there. It is, I think, a Region 1 Blu-ray, um, so it won't play all over the world, but it'll play in America, Canada, and I think the UK. Um, but it is NTSC. It's not POW, if, if you if you know what those things are um, in terms of your player. And then um, it's also now streaming for free on Amazon Prime uh, in, I think, America and the UK. And I'm trying to get it further. I'm trying to get it uh, awesome. in some places so, so other people can check it out too. But uh, yeah, uh, feel free to check that out. And I also, I love hearing feedback. So if anybody wants to let me know what they thought of the movie, whether they liked it or not, uh, most of my handles are just at Aramento on Instagram and Twitter. So uh, I love hearing from people about what they thought of it. So, yeah. I'll put all of the links in the description. So if anyone wants to check it out, it's over there. Oh, cool. Great. So um, that sums up the interview. Thank you guys so much for okay, watching. Great. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. See ya. See you later. You're pissing me off, Roger. It's gonna be wild tonight.